Welcome to LinkedIn News Live, a show about the world of work and our place in it. I'm Joe Malord in for Nina Melendez. Today we are celebrating Black History Month, and though it's time to recognize Black excellence and achievement, it's also time to point out barriers to progress. So on today's show, we are going to address a variety of topics, including how Black people show up to work, the importance of mentorship in their career journeys, and some of the hidden barriers on their path to leadership. And one thing we want you to remember is this conversation is for you, our viewers. So don't forget to put in your questions in the stream for our panelists. If you have a question, for example, on how to navigate certain situations at work, let us know. Our panelists are here to help. And without further ado, let me introduce them. Brittany Noble is a journalist and educator. And George Wells is the CFO of Barstool Sports and founder of the Wells Group, a strategic finance consulting firm. Thank you guys for joining me. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. All right, so I wanted to start with a pretty basic question, but one that's really appropriate for this month, of course. Uh, Brittany, I'll start with you. How has identity impacted and informed your career journey so far? You know, I didn't take into account really identity when I first decided to become a broadcast journalist. It wasn't until I was reporting for a good number of years that I realized that I would be a better journalist if I showed up as my authentic self. And so um, that is kind of been my journey in finding identity on my career path. Uh, and George, for you, you're both an executive and an entrepreneur. I'm curious, how has identity impacted the way you think about both paths? That's a great question, Joe. I think of identity really in two buckets. So there's one, the identity that my parents, my dad, my mom, my grandfather had on me, right? And from that perspective, I always knew I could achieve whatever I set my mind to because I had seen success in other Black men in my family and knew it was possible for me. Now, I am in a very different field than my grandfather or my dad. Um, but I think when I left that nest and went into the real world, I realized that when I walked into a room, people had expectations for how meetings would go or how interviews would go. Um, and I had to kind of remove the noise of like what they were expecting so that I, I felt like I could drive the outcome. Um, obviously there's a lot of racism that ex exists, but I felt like if I didn't as much as possible, not fall victim to let my blackness or my queerness, like obfuscate the conversation, I could go further. Mm. And George, I want to stay with you, but first I want to say hello to some of our viewers that's watching from home, Jake in Chicago, Mohammed in Ethiopia, uh, everyone, thank you for joining. And remember, you can submit your questions for our panelists, George, uh, let's stay on your career. Um, You've been an executive at multiple uh, <laughs> companies. Congratulations. I'm curious, do you feel a, a responsibility to impact the experiences of perhaps Black professionals in a way that maybe your peers might not? Or do you think it's, everyone has a, a, a similar level of responsibility? That's a great question. When I think of my peers, not that many of my peers would be having a conversation like this mm -hmm. about breaking down barriers mm -hmm. because those barriers oftentimes don't exist for my peers that don't look like me. Um, so I think that, I mean, it's kind of a, I, so I do feel a sense of responsibility. I was lucky because I was in programs like Inroads and SEO and I saw what was possible and the corporate jargon and the corporate talk. And I had that mentorship and I had those opportunities so I do try to give back, whether that's to my alma mater Morehouse, I try to lend my time um, because I do think the responsibility is greater for black men or black people working in corporate in the corporate world because not everyone knows what's on the other side. Mm. Uh, Brittany, I want to get to a subject that you've talked about, uh, to say the least, <laughs> over the past couple of years. The Crown Act has been passed in many different iterations uh, across 20 states in the country. There are probably going to be more in the next couple of years. I just want to get an expression from you. Uh, what is the relationship between Black professionals and their hair, and what's particular about it? And how does le legislation like the Crown Act impact that relationship? Well, I can speak from personal experience. I've just gone through great lengths to try to straighten my hair and to have a, a perfect look, a professional look uh, for the workplace, especially on TV. And um, now that I'm showing up as my authentic self, I just can't do that anymore. And uh, I, I enjoy 
wearing uh, my natural hair, not using chemicals to straighten my hair, and not using a ton of different heat devices to straighten my hair. Um, and the Crown Act protects that, right? It protects the ability for us to wear our natural hair and protective hairstyles. And that wasn't the case when I was on TV back in 2018. I, there were no um, laws protecting uh, hair. And so, you know, I've seen things change, and, and but there's a lot more change that still needs to happen for sure. Yeah. And I definitely want to come back to this issue, but I, I think there's another subject that falls under this wider umbrella of showing up at the workplace. Uh, let's dig a little deeper on the, another feature that can be typical for Black professionals. Here's LinkedIn News producer Mary Wilson, who spoke with Kaya Hazard, a mental health therapist and clinical supervisor on the issue of cold switching. What effects can hiding parts of yourself have on someone? You, you develop this like hypervigilance. It's, it's um, incredibly anxiety provoking to, ha to have to sort of hide, really hide and, and be something other than you are all the time. I grew up in Massachusetts. So I grew up being the only one in, this, in my classrooms. I grew up waiting for the teacher to butcher my name when they were calling the roll call and then everybody in my class would laugh at me. I, you know, and, and embracing myself for those types of experiences to be the only one, it's, it's uncomfortable um, because I think as humans, we all want to fit in, we all want to feel like we belong. I think the code switching stems from not being um, accepted and having access to certain spaces, especially in corporate America. People need to get educated. People need to find out what it means, what, what racism looks like, what microaggressions look like. Um, and it's not on black people to, you know, be the advocates, be the ones speaking up all the time. If the changes are going to happen, it comes from the leadership down. Once again, that was LinkedIn News producer Mary Wilson speaking with Kaya Hazard. Uh, Brittany, we know that code switching can be a feature of Black professionals' experience at work. Is it necessarily a negative one? For me, it has been negative because I just realized at what great lengths I was going, going through just to try to code switch. Um, changing my hair. For example, even today, mm -hmm. I had my hair at first in like two pigtails and I'm like, wait, I'm at LinkedIn, I'm talking about professionalism, I need to make sure that my hair is down. Um, I constantly think about the way that I'm talking and if I'm, um, if I'm comfortable or if I'm just trying to, to portray a certain image. So is it a negative thing? It can be, it can be overwhelming because you're not living in your true self. You're trying to pretend that you're somebody else and it's, it's too much right. for me. George, I, I want to ask you a similar question. And of course, you know, the, the, I guess the devil's accurate argument is that professionals of all shades have to change the way they might speak on a cover alert or in the workplace. How do you feel about the same question? Is it necessarily a negative feature of black professionals experience code switching? I think code switching in general is not negative but when it's loaded with hundreds of years of like racism and slavery and Jim Crow, I think it's can be harmful. First, everyone goes to work and is like a professional version of themselves. Second, I think that a lot of black culture has been appropriated. So I feel like code switching 20 years ago when I started my career versus now is probably less vital because like there are non-blacks that are using terms that were coined in the black community and like black culture at least is embraced at a major level in most parts of america especially in cities like new york but i feel like when you feel like you're having to hide your identity or your blackness i think it is detrimental because your colleagues can actually see that you're not being authentic mm -hmm. and it's actually causes distrust right because they don't know that you're having to code switch they don't know why you're holding back so i do think being as authentic as possible is important because when you are other adding this element of not saying what's authentic can really harm you while you think it's helping you mm. and I, I find it interesting that you guys are speaking uh about this subject with uh a wide amount of range because you mentioned within code switching the idea of thinking about your hair what are the other ways outside of just live conversation that you think black professionals or that you've seen black professionals that had to code switch it's it's i, I don't even 
no to what great lengths I'm actually code switching. Um, I just think that I want to fit in so badly, you know, that I'll do anything that I can just to fit in. And I'm sure that other people deal with that as well. I know for me, my voice and my hair was a big um, part of that. Um, sometimes the stories that I tell, mm. you know, wanting to be a reporter and report certain stories and and having to flip that switch and be like everyone else. Um, it, it's just loaded. There's so many ways in which I'm just trying to be the norm mm. Mm. when I really do stand out. Uh, and I do want to go to some of our viewers again. Thank you to Diana in Seattle, uh, Ronald in Tulsa and V in Virginia, and also Christina who asked, George, for you, uh, regarding what you said earlier, what were the expectations that you felt when you were working in the room, cer certain rooms that you referenced earlier? So for the last 14 years, I've been a CFO of tech startups. Um, I would say 14 years ago when I walked in the room, people were like, hey, get me a coffee. Like they didn't even, ex they were, they did not connect the head of finance for a growing tech company as someone that was black. It wasn't even like their brains did not compute. And then when you sit down for the meeting, people are still in a state of shock because they almost like you have to prove yourself very early on in the meeting that you deserve to be there. So you're always looking for that moment to say like the perfect thing or to prove out like your existence in that space. Um, and so I think that is where it's, that's where it, it, it can be impactful. Yeah. Uh, and Brittany, you know, I, earlier today, you were talking about as far as uh, 2018, the way in which you were thinking about your hair and, 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 you know, how I impacted the way that you were showing up. The reason why I wanted to point out the year is because I feel like over the past few years, we've seen a shift in the way people talk about it, the way in which people in your field, reporters are sharing pictures online about how they're, how they're showing up. Have you seen as rapid of a, of, of a, a switch in the way in people talking about this wider subject? I think there has been a switch and it is uh, very promising to see more reporters wearing braids or wearing other protective hairstyles. I will say since 2018, I've been looking for work back on TV and I'm not working. Um, as I had been in local news before and wearing locks. I don't see a lot of news reporters wearing locks nowadays either. So um, yes, change has happened and I love to see it, but we still have a long way to go. Mm. And I wanna get a comment in from Keith. Thank you again. You can submit comments for our panelists. Keith says, I salute her for staying natural while on the television industry. What an inspiration uh, you are. Um, George, you know, you were talking about again, the expectations that you might have noticed in walking into rooms. I'm curious, did that impact how you were thinking about yourself or any confidence that you might have in delivering whatever message that you had to have or performing your job? It's a great question. Um, when I worked at Morgan Stanley like 24 years ago, I started there. And during the summer analyst training, Ray McGuire, who is like a very big investment banker, Wall Street titan, once said that being black puts a spotlight on you and you can use it to shine or you can use it to at your own demise, you know? And I feel like I just kind of walked in the room and tried to own it. And I also realized a long time ago, I had to be twice as good at the same things to get the recognition and the combination of those two forces. I was just like, I'm gonna go in there and crush it but I don't think that's a normal interpretation of those series of events because it's hard to be twice as good, right? It's hard to move past the societal noise or the expectations that people set for you. So it takes a lot of work and confidence. And if you don't have any precedence for that, I think it's almost impossible to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, now I want to get to another important issue for us. Uh, let's talk about mentorship and how important it is to the upward mobility, particularly for Black people in the workplace. We're going to go back to Mary Wilson, who this time chatted with Mariah Mosley, a social media manager at Vice Media. What is your definition of mentorship? Uh, being a mentor goes beyond a few emails or a coffee date. Mentorship is investing in someone. 
Um, particularly investing in someone that is interested in the career field that you're in and you're able to sort of share those tips, um, share opportunities with them and just pour into them, especially for um, people of color, um, particularly black women. It's really great to be able to have someone that you can lean on. You can say, hey, you know, this was tough. What should I do, et cetera? I started my career at Essence Magazine, which of course is tailored for black women. And being around so many black women, especially so early on in my career, it made me know and understand who I am. I used to sit in the audience of The View and Good Morning America just so that I could be, <laughs> just so I could be in the space. So it was really great for me to be able to land that dream job. And my dream job from ABC came from a black woman being able to have my back and listen to me and say, hey, here's some other opportunities within the company. Once again, that was LinkedIn News producer Mary Wilson. That time talking with Mariah Mosley, a social media manager at Vice Media. Brittany, on the subject of mentorship, uh, has there been an instance in which mentorship was consequential in your career? In, you can't listen to everybody. You still have to follow your heart, right? You still have to go with your gut. Only you know the best decision for you. But mentorship is so key because it can just help you uh, it can help open your eyes to things that you just had not seen before. And so it is, um, it's certainly key and has been instrumental in my my career. I love the way you answered that question because it's not just a black and white thing, mentorship, good, bad. Mm -hmm. uh, um, George, I, you know, I know you probably, I'm assuming have hired, hired people, promoted people, seen people come up uh, for those trying to advance. Do you think, especially black professionals, do you think it's important to seek out black mentors in particular? Well, I think that's a great question. I think first, I think black men should attend HBCUs. Like I think it's so, such a pivotal time in growing up, 18 to 22. It's nice to actually remove the external factors beyond, you know, the, obviously there's Morehouse wasn't like the perfect place, but at least I knew I was never being judged by the color of my skin. And I knew that when corporate recruiters were coming there, I knew they were looking for people like me. And I think it removed an element at a critical time of just like focusing on me and being the best version of myself. So I had a lot of mentors at Morehouse, right? I had, everyone looked like me. And like, I found my own track there, which I had its own mentors during that critical college year period. After that, I also had mentors at Morgan Stanley and at Goldman Sachs, where I kind of the first two places I worked after college. But I would say that the mentors that once my career really got going and I was like firmly, at least in the front the first door, at least in the living room, I would say that I look for mentors that didn't look like me. I look for mentors that shared other interests than me interest with me, right? I look for people that like to play tennis or that like to ski or, you know, like cocktails. Like I tried to find other places of commonality because I find still it's very hard for black men to mentor other black men or women in the workplace because there's a considered risk associated with lending your name out there for someone else. And I found that the people that embraced me the most after getting into the living room, we're not black, you know, but it's about finding the common interest. People see differences a lot more than they see similarities. And I think if you find ways to connect to black people, purple people, green people, that's the way that you advance. Because if like my white Jewish boss from Long Island is going to go to bat for me in a room when it comes to raises or promotions, no one's going to question the motives. Also, he works on my team. So I think it's good to look for mentorship in a lot of different ways, both lookalikes and not. Mm. Rennie, I know that you also attended an HBCU as well. And while he was uh, reminding uh, us about going to Morehouse, as they tend to do, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was curious, um, when you entered the professional world, did you ever reflect on how that experience at the HBCU um, prepared you for that professional world in a particular way? It increased my confidence yeah. to show up as myself um, in the professional world. And you're right. You know, I know we talked about earlier that idea of having to show up 
better than or two times as good as. And that's something that we talked about a lot in HBCU too, is how to make sure you are the best, you are well prepared in whatever room that you walk into. So um, it was a great choice for me, um, for boys and for girls, yeah. HBCU. Uh, you know, it has been a life changer for me. Yeah. And I want to include our audience uh, into this discussion. Diana uh, says, culture can be exhausting in terms of feeling like feeling like you're an imposter or imp feeling imposter syndrome. Thank you guys for sharing. I'm going to thank you guys as well. And Stephanie has an interesting question for you, which is, how has a Black woman, have you been able to find your voice and communicate in a way that doesn't come off as angry? Mm -hmm. um, and the obvious, the obvious suggestion from her there is that there can be more of a risk of sounding like the angry black woman in the office um, when you're maybe trying to confront a specific type of issue. Do you have experience uh, that sounds any where remotely uh, similar here? I don't want to assume. Sure, um, I can't really be concerned about how other people feel about me. I can only try my best in that moment, you know, in the moments that we're together that I I give you my best and then I'm kind and, you know, hopefully you'll return that. Um, for me, it's just kind of like a, it's learning. It's learning and growing, yeah. learning and growing. And that's, that's all I've been trying to do. Mm. For George, Stephanie yeah. in our audience, and thank you once again, I'm really liking these questions, As have you thought consciously about supporting your black female colleagues uh, uh, in the workplace? Is there, like, is, have you had to think again, consciously about that or, you know, does it come naturally or has that been something that you've had to work on? That's a great question. Um, I did when I worked at big firms, right? Mm -hmm. When I worked at Goldman and Morgan Stanley, like there was a lot, there was like an HBCU community mm -hmm. or a young black professional community within those firms. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you know, obviously at my firm, I have black women that work for me and I have black men. And so I do try to hire, hire like black people. Like it's not a detriment to be black when we're going through the hiring process. Like we, I'm, we're actively trying to find more and more. So Stephanie, if you're looking for roles, let me know, Wells Group is hiring. Um, and also at Barstool, we value diversity. We're looking for people. I find oftentimes because of societal constructs, the supply and demand is off. So it's yeah. like, I wish I had more black women applying for jobs where I work. I don't see that many resumes and I'm not a white man saying this. I'm saying this as a black man, it, I'm not getting them because people, because of the societal constructs, people don't know a level of like barrier the resumes aren't meeting the people looking to make the hiring decisions. And I'd love to mentor through hiring people into my firm that look like me, that look like my mom and create environments that are meritocracies where they can thrive, but also realize what I can say to them is very different than what I might say to someone else. And I, I think it's important to motivate diverse voices to mm -hmm. propel companies ahead and too many people look for echo chambers. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that directly answered the question, but I tried to do hiring at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're having these conversations among ourselves and I think we can have it while not being scared of any one area. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious how both of you guys think about the ways in which you'd like corporate leaders to be talking about some of these issues. Brittany, I'll go, I'll go to you. Um, do you think that there's a particular way to talk to people who have the power to change some of these barriers? And do you ever reflect on the ways that we build consensus around the fact that there needs to be change? I think we just need to continue having conversations and not being closed minded, but being open and receptive um, to, happy, to having those really, really tough um, moments where you're being vulnerable and you're learning and you're growing. And I think that's the only way that we'll see real sustainable change is if we're, um, more attention is being put into the decisions that we're making. And George, I have a version of that question for you. Um, I suspect sometimes if we really wanted to say how we really felt about certain issues, it could come across more blunt, 
confrontational. Do you think that there is not there is a way to speak more strategically to build consensus around pushing for change? Do you feel that you can describe certain issues that Black professionals face authentically, or have to massage the message in a certain way to achieve the ultimate goal? I think that's a good question. I think following like the racial reckoning, following George Floyd's murder, everyone was playing lip service to like wanting diversity. Diversity coach demand went through the roof, right? It was like phenomenal to see. But I think the narratives have to become more relatable, right? One of the best diversity coaches I heard was explaining how if you go to the Knicks game and you're wearing a Celtics jersey and you're on the other side, it makes being other relatable for people. I think that there's a level of pushback on just like, I, I've heard people say this to me and I'm like, why would you say this to me? I'm so sick of talking about race. Mm -hmm. And it's like, eh. But when you, which is like fun, like a crazy thing to say to like a black person, but, and this was from a non-black person, but I think when you make it more tangible and you say like, have you ever felt, Joey, Becky, have you ever felt like when you were on the other side and you were at a sports game, when you make it relatable, I think it changes. So I'm never really filtered. I'm always like very direct, but I think that we need to nuance the conversation to impact change because not everyone that's heard it a certain way has heard it and then made change, but we need to build a wider coalition of people that are looking to make corporate America more inviting. I think that's a great point for us to end. Thank you both. Uh, once again, that was George Wells of Wells Group and Brayden Noble, journalist and educator. And thank you to our viewers watching, especially Eldrin, Alex, and Echo. Thank you for your questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them. But you can continue the conversation here, or you can check out some of the other stories in the news feed to the right of your screen. I'm Joe Lord. Thank you for watching LinkedIn News Live.